All right. On this Garlic Marketing Show, we're going to talk about how one agency helped a law firm get 76% more cases from their website through targeting the Hispanic market. Leo, say hi. Hola. Hola. Leo's from uh, Nanado Media, and we're going to talk about the huge Hispanic opportunity in the digital space. The number one thing to understand before starting there, the surprising and most valuable segment that I was really surprised about in the layers of Hispanic targeting, the five segments of those targeting, the biggest opportunity in digital marketing there, the number one search market, and why the click-through rate, the CTR and search ads is so much bigger in the Latino market, huge opportunity in YouTube Hispanic marketing, and why you should ditch translation and what to do instead, uncovering the most valuable keywords, and we're going to talk about the video strategy for Spanish website, and of course, video type, length, and style of videos. All of this on this Garlic Marketing Show, but of course, this is brought to you by VideoCaseStory.com. One of the best ways to get in touch with your market, to understand your market, is through the video case story process. It's a process. Learn more about how we help you strategize, collect, craft, and deliver those video case stories by going to VideoCaseStory.com. All right, let's get started. I think this is such an important topic, and I don't. I think I've maybe had one episode out of five hundred on it, and it's <laughs> it's such an important topic. I'm here in Florida, and you go a little south of here, and, and no one speaks English. Which I mean, that's fine. It's just that it's such an opportunity that I think so many people are getting missing and then getting wrong. And I want to talk a little bit about you helped one law firm get close 76% more cases without driving a whole lot more traffic. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about yourself, your agency, and your books. Yeah, thanks. And sure. So it's it's actually interesting because we first, before we actually decided, okay, we're going to create a marketing agency, we first identified the opportunity, right? As we both know so many marketing agencies that they decide, okay, we're going to do a marketing agency and then we're going to figure out how are we going to find our niche. With us, it was very different, right? We actually found a niche and then we were like, wow, there's really no one helping out these businesses do things right. And so that's how it all came to be. Now, it also happens to be that in our previous career, before we became agency owners, and I'm talking about Natalie, my co-founder, and me, we were already doing the advertising and marketing and business development for a big organization focused in the Hispanic market. And then that's how like, we realized, and not because we are very smart people, but in reality, because the clients of this organization, the people who were actually going to them to get Hispanic clients for their own businesses, were telling you, listen, guys, we love you. But at the end of the day, we would also love to be able to market our own brands to the Hispanic market so we can be more diversified, right? We can have the lead generation, but we can also have our own brand being known. And then a light bulb went on and we were like, ah, so yeah, they just don't have the insights, the understanding, the cultural awareness, the manpower to help you help them do that. So here is an opportunity. And then next thing we know is we quit our jobs and we open up our own marketing agency. And here we are now. That's fantastic. And you work with attorneys primarily, but you work mm -hmm. with other types of businesses too, correct? Yeah, I think we're 90% focused in the legal industry right now. A uh, few reasons for that. That's like the vertical, the industry that we learned Hispanic marketing in the United States. And so we're very comfortable. In my case, I feel like a native legal marketer because I was all basically raised in this industry, in this environment, and it's very intuitive for me. But obviously, as we've grown to gain more experience marketing to the Hispanic market, we've also learned to market for many other verticals, but primarily we're focused on service providers. And so that's why going back to, to, to the books, right? At some point, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, we were like, you know what? It feels like this is a great time to potentially sit down and write a book because it seems like we're going to be indoors for a very long time. <laughs> and so <laughs> we set ourselves the goal of writing a chapter per, per week. It's funny, actually. I'll be more honest about it. It did not arise as the idea of writing a book. We first wanted it to revamp the content in our website, right? Just create better content in our website. And so the first thing we realized after a month of doing that is, man, some of these articles are actually turning very long. They're 3,000 pages, 3,000 words long. So maybe we can group several of these together and 
create them into chapters and maybe eventually we'll have a book. And then that's eventually how, like by the end, first year of the end of the pandemic, we had a manuscript. We worked with editors and with a publisher. And by early summer of 2021, we published our first book, which is Beyond Sable Español, How Lawyers Win the Hispanic Market, where we said, basically spilled all of our tricks and secrets that we know have helped law firms enter the Hispanic market, grow, and in some cases, even dominate. And beyond Seabon Espanol, he, they, tell me about what you've got in there. What do you find that people need to focus on when they're starting to enter the Hispanic market, especially in digital marketing? Yeah, great. I love that question because before you even start marketing to the Hispanic market, you need to understand who are you as Hispanics. That's the most important thing. I think, especially every time that we get close to elections, you start hearing a lot in news channels or reading articles in renowned publications that Latinos in the U.S. are not monolithic, right? There is a lot of diversity and there is a lot of different segments and it's 100% true. And so you just need to keep that in mind throughout your entire marketing funnel. And the first thing that we do in our book is explain the different segments in the way that we think are important. A lot of people... Like first, the first thing that comes to mind when they think about the diversity in the Hispanic community in the U.S. is like different nationalities, right? Of course, because the Mexicans are not the same as the Puerto Ricans and the Puerto Ricans are not the same as the Colombians. And so, yes, that's a way of segmenting, but that's not the most relevant way of segmenting. The first layer of segmentation that you should actually complete when you are targeting the Hispanic market should be level of acculturation, right? And acculturation being how assimilated they are to the American lifestyle, society, or ways, whatever is the way you'd like to call that. And there are five segments. There's some that are Latinos that have been here in the United States for generations. They're U.S. born they speak English, maybe no Spanish at all, but they still see themselves as Latinos because that's their heritage, right? You have first generation born Latinos in the United States who are born from migrant parents, but they already born in, are born in the United States. They speak English, but they also have a very strong connection to Spanish because that's the language they grew up hearing at home. And then you have also other segments like ambiculturales, who are what we also know as dreamers. These are Latinos who immigrated to the United States as children or young adults. And so they're very integrated into the U.S. society, yet they are immigrants, oftentimes undocumented, and they have a very good level of understanding of what Latino migrants that are coming from back from back in their countries feel and think, but also see things through the lens of American society. I think this is a very rich and valuable segment. And then you have others, which are the Latino Americanas who have been here in the United States for less than 10 years. This is like your recent arrivals. These are the people that have arrived here over the past three months, but have not been here beyond 10 years. These people are primarily Spanish speakers, right? They have very strong bonds and they're very attached to their country of origins. And so for that reason, they are not as integrated. And then you have also Hispanos, which are the ones that immigrated to the United States also as adults, but have been here for more than 20 years. And you tend to see here a lot of blue collar workers, people who have already started families, large families for most cases. They brought maybe siblings and parents from their country also to join them here in the United States. And so when you start looking at all of these different segments, you may understand and realize that if you want to be relevant to some of them, your marketing messaging needs to be very different, starting from the point that in some cases you may want to use English to target them, but still recognizing their Latino culture and the Latino heritage in the way that you're positioning yourself. That's interesting. It's an interesting way to think of it culturally and not just language wise. And that that's because I think most of these, we've got just basic people are like, I'm just going to translate this in Spanish. You've got people that understand there's different dialects, but I think that's yeah. a, I really haven't thought about like how long have they been here? How, what's their cultural take on everything? And where do you see the biggest opportunity in right now for service businesses in the Hispanic market? Google Ad Search Network, 100%, hands down. And I'll be honest, there are some industries where this has already become 
extremely competitive, the legal industry for once, very competitive, particularly if you're in the personal injury space, cost per clicks now go into the hundreds of dollars. But here is what we've identified, right? And this is not just us claiming to know this information. These are studies completed by Google themselves who have identified, first of all, Latinos prefer Google over any other search network at a rate of 90% of the population is using Google as their preferred, Latino, Latinos in the United States are using Google as their preferred search engine. Now, the other thing that we know is that Latinos are just in average 20% more likely to interact with ads on the search results page. And the reason for that is I strongly believe that the content that is waiting for them on the organic section of the search results page is just not good. Mm. It is most of times based out of translations, very poorly crafted pages or websites. And it's not just that, it's complicated to navigate through. Oftentimes it's not as user-friendly. And so I think just out of habit, they've learned, listen, here on top, on the top, on, on the amount that we, on the place where we need to put the least amount of effort to potentially find a solution, there are options from some who seem to have put a decent amount of effort into creating a messaging and you know, presenting us a solution that may be relevant for us. So why don't we start there? Why don't we start our exploration there? Maybe we can find a solution there and then make our way down if those things are not working out. But we certainly see when we do comparisons for clients for which we run bilingual campaigns, Spanish and English, the click-through rate from Spanish-speaking users is just mind-blowing when it comes down to, to search ads. And so if you were to ask me what is one of the highest opportunities out there to increase your revenues to new clients in the Hispanic market would be explore the search network. Nice. That's amazing. And the number two for most other, for English speaking at least, number two most used search engine is YouTube. How are yeah. you using YouTube in the Hispanic and Latino market? Oh, it's a must. It's a must. It's really interesting to see how Latinos have adopted YouTube, not just as a platform for streaming video, but as an audio streaming platform. Yes. And I think people are starting to get more used to the idea that YouTube is not a platform where there is like a direct response sort of impact, right? Mm -hmm. You do not run an ad in YouTube and then expect for people to go to the landing page and call you right there from there. And then because they're not in YouTube open to that type of interaction, they're there to consume content, right? Yep. But it's such a massive touch point because we just know that YouTube is amongst Latinos one of the main channels from where they consume infotainment. And the reason why I say audio as well is because so much music is being streamed through YouTube and including podcasts, right? Even though Latinos are not necessarily power consumers of podcasts, when they do, they're more likely to consume it through YouTube than through any other platform. For music streaming, just also to keep up to date with information about their countries and such, they love using YouTube for those purposes. And then obviously other social media networks such as Facebook and Instagram are extremely powerful to connect with the Hispanic market. So That's yeah, interesting. yes and yes. Yeah, I, it's because I've been telling people this for a while because it's weird. It's this weird thing where I tell people you need to market on YouTube and people are like, I, I, that doesn't work for my audience. And I'm like, everyone's on there. And then I'm like, you need to make sure your podcast is on there. I'm like, no one listens to podcasts on YouTube. I'm like, I know so, so many people tell me they listen to my podcast on YouTube while they're walking around. And I'm like, and I have 20 pod YouTube list or podcast listeners. And yeah. So I can only imagine like these big podcasts, it's free, it's easy. And, uh -huh. and yeah, but like you said, it's not a direct response methodology per se, but you can definitely get it in, get them into a funnel from there. Yeah. It's a very valuable touch point. In my opinion, I think the more frequency of use they have on a given platform, the more impactful is for them to actually see you there. So I think it's a very valuable place to be and certainly a must when it comes down to brand positioning and brand building. Yeah, no, for sure. And where do you see the biggest mistakes being made? 
in converting and targeting the Hispanic market? <laughs> Thanks. I always enjoy answering that question because I think it's very it's a simple answer and maybe even predictable for some. I think the mistake is translation. And I, I think I've said this or I've said this already in so many podcasts that I feel bad for not coming for some for something more unique. But it is <laughs> no, but it is translation. And I think nowadays, especially as we are entering the era where AI is extremely attractive and empowering. It's very important to keep in mind the dangers of translation. And here is, here is what I'm trying to say by translation, right? I'm not just referring the, the meaning of taking a word from one language and converting it into another language. That's not just it. When I'm talking about translation, I'm talking about you thinking of your English speaking buyer persona and thinking, okay, I have a market where there's people that also speak other languages. I need to now take the message that I have crafted for the English speaking person and create exactly the same message for the person that does not speak the same language. And here is where I see that being a huge mistake. And you know this very well, Ian, as marketeers, right? We are obsessed about how can we choose the right words and frame things in the right light so that we can be highly relevant to the audience that we're trying to target, right? And that takes a very deep understanding of who are you talking to. Now, when you're saying, I'm going to take that and translate it into a different language and wrong with that for the segment that speaks that other language, you're throwing out of the window everything, all of your beliefs as marketeer for that market and for that segment. Because the way that you are framing your value proposition for a particular user who speaks one English, one language may not be the same for another user that speaks a different language. In fact, the fact that they speak a different language, that I have a different cultural background, means that you're probably gonna have to figure out a way to understand them, their background, their nuances, and frame and position your value proposition in a way that is gonna be highly relevant for them, which may have nothing to do with the way that you're framing and positioning it for your English speaking market. And so that is what I mean by translation, right? You think that kind of like you can take your ideal customer that speaks English and just assume that it's gonna be identical to your <laughs> ideal customer that is a Spanish speaker and it's not matching. So that's where I see the biggest problem. And mind you, I'm not here hammering down on translations that are being done on Google Translate, or nowadays through ChatGPT, which are tremendous and very valuable tools. You hire a very talented translator and get them to translate your service page into a different language, right? They'll literally, they're being tasked with really taking your message and converting it into a different language, right? They cannot reframe your value proposition because that's not what they're there to do. Right. So that's why we believe you should ditch translation and go for transcreation. And what transcreation, allo transcreation allows you to do is it basically allows you to examine the individuals who also happen to be speakers of a different language, understand their cultural background, their pain points, and create a message that is highly relevant to them tackling their particular pain points. And then you're going to end up with content that's going to work. So I, you know, yeah, I hope this is, I just learned the word transcreation of content two weeks ago and it makes absolute sense, right? It makes absolute mm -hmm. sense, especially it's interesting because when I first got started SEO like 15 years ago, and we weren't such a, like in the U S wasn't so homogenous because the internet wasn't so vast. And every city I went to had different keywords that would work for lawyers. Every yeah. city I went to had different keywords that would work for individual businesses. <laughs> and it was really interesting. And I think this is, we're probably at the same place now. So now I do this transcreation 
but how are you doing? Because the other thing I know with keywords is you can do keyword research and see what's volume, but yeah. that, that volume doesn't necessarily mean the highest intent. Yeah. How are you figuring that out? Yeah, I think just like most of SEO processes or pay-per-click campaign build processes have, you do your keyword research and you also identify which keywords have volume and you also measure the level of intent by the way that phrases are built. Now, particularly for the industries in which we work, this is like the first stage of it all, right? Before we even start building a campaign is really understanding how are people who have reached the point where they're ready to buy are searching for things, right? And so that's why things like near me or best or such have hinted us that these are users that are already getting ready to initiate a conversation and they want to make sure that they're taking good decisions around that. Now, in our particular case, and talking about the Hispanic market, we've just have now over a decade of data that is telling us what are the search terms that just happen to be on demand by Latinos who have certain legal needs, how are they searching for it, for them, and how are they are for in, in which they tend to convert higher. And so we definitely use that and we take that into consideration. But one thing that is very important here to remember, and, and the reality is this, you don't have to be a genius to really identify what are those keywords. Really, any person who is well-versed in pay-per-click could potentially come up with those. And with tools like Google Translate and ChatGPT, you can very come up with a set of keywords that are very likely to be highly relevant, very competitive, and get you a good chance. Nowadays, also with Google and their whole process of match types, you also don't need to do that much of, of the heavy lifting in researching. You only say a little bit of what is it that you do. You can even put it in English and Google will maybe decide to, ch to show your ads for Spanish search queries. Now, will, will people click on an ad that's showing up in English for a search query that is in Spanish? I highly doubt it. But the bottom line is that Google is telling you, you know, these are the keywords. Words. I think the problem lies more in whether once the ad gets pulled up, right? To get your ads to show up is not that hard anymore. I think it's more about making your ads stand out, making sure that in those three or four lines of text or copy that show up, you can really convey in a very efficient and powerful way that this is the business that you're looking for. Because as you can see, we speak well and understand you and have taken steps to make it easy for you to come and be serviced by us. So I think that's the focus that marketeers should have more now, not so much looking at just getting to show up for the right ads. And that's why we see a lot of call-only ads when it comes down to service providers targeting the Hispanic market is because they can figure out how to get to show their ads. But when it comes down to creating copy, building a landing page, they're like, no, none of that. We cannot do that. Like we're just <laughs> here ready to show up a phone number and keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> the PRs are very low. <laughs> With, in thinking about that and everything you've said, you helped one law firm grow or get 76 more, is it leads or actual cases? 76% increase on cases signed from their website. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, it's quite remarkable when we look at these numbers. And this is one story of many others in different spaces, but this has just happened to be recent. As I was telling you a moment ago, we just recorded a video testimonial with them. And first of all, it's a very humbling process to see how much appreciation they have over the results that we've achieved. But most importantly, is really having had the opportunity of them explain once again verbally the pain that it was to have a partner that as experienced as they were in doing legal SEO, they were just not getting the Hispanic part, right? And so when we took over that website, the website was already driving traffic. And so we've been able to make an increase in the amount of traffic that the website gets 
but not as substantial as the 76% that we've got in case signups. But what we were able to do is redesign completely the website, come up with a new site, mm -hmm. optimize it for conversion. And then as a result of that, we now have users that come to the website and they don't bounce out, but they actually see that this is a genuine firm that is capable of servicing them, that they feel comfortable with, that it's easy for them to figure out the way around, and they just initiate their conversion process right there and then. And so that is a great uh, reminder of the same thing that we were just mentioning a moment ago. You can get your ads to show up. You can get the traffic into the side. The question is your messaging, is your user experience compelling enough to actually convert the leads? And that's where I believe having an in-depth understanding of the market really comes to show and comes to play. And as far as video goes, did you do any video on this website? Yeah. So there is a few things there. They have a fantastic creative mind. So their TV commercials and the content that they put up on social media is very good because they really care about it. And they are working consistently on raising the bar and challenging themselves to come with more creative ideas to come with a diverse set of content that both addresses like the business messaging, but also is actively social and such. And so for us, it's been terrific because we now have a whole range of videos that are either on YouTube or on TikTok or on Facebook or on Instagram that we can actually take and embed into different sections of the website that are they are relevant for. And I think that's extremely important to remember, especially when you are addressing an audience that is primarily a mobile user, is that you can have amazing content in your website. You can have pages, service pages that are 5,000 words long. Nobody's going to want to read that no. in a mobile phone. But if you have some interesting videos that they are short, that they are dynamic and that they get to the point, that can make a big difference. And so we are 100% making it a priority to ensure that we have a video in every single money page, but also in our blog articles and other sections where we can feel we can keep the user longer by having that. And there's other things, Ian, that you can have, right? Just having some a widget on the something we recently implemented in this website and many others is having just a little index widget that shows up as you get to a practice area page or to a blog article that gives you all of the different sections inside of that page. Again, to make it easier for the user to find the content that they really need or that interests them without them having to scroll through the entire page endlessly. Okay. And so I think conversion rate optimization is massive. I think video is huge when it comes down to moving something in the minds and the brains of the people who are coming to the page and getting them to want to take an action. And with us, and especially when we talk about client stories and video wow. and client videos and showing off the firm or showing off the service provider, we want to show off the main person, but obviously you know, if it's an English speaking person, you probably want to have a, a Spanish speaker, but are you finding like a different style of videos working better in the Hispanic market than it does the, the English speaking market? I think if I were to make recommendations for very general for service providers, what are the videos that I think could be the most effective? are the ones that in very simple terms and under one minute can explain a client the process of getting things started, right? So that gives them all of the information that they need and also sets expectations of how things are going to run down the moment that they initiate a conversation. I think that's extremely effective. I would 100% recommend for those videos to be, even on the website, put up on vertical mode or four or five aspect ratio so that you can really leverage the mobile phone screen dimensions and get them a video where they're not gonna have to really 
flip the phone sideways to, to see it. So thinking about those things is important. The other videos in general that I think are essential and should be given priority are those that address pain points, right? And that's where it's really become important for you to understand your Hispanic market because you need to, or your Hispanic client, because you need to know what are their pain points. And I can give you an example here that is very particular to the legal industry, but I think everyone will be able to understand it. And is, for instance, if you're a personal injury lawyer and you are promoting your services to the general market, particularly to those who speak English, you may not necessarily feel the need of mentioning in your messaging, you may, if you've been involved in a car wreck, if you're injured, you may be entitled of a compensation and your legal status doesn't matter, right? Like, why would you mention the legal status? Who cares? Assuming that most of people who are English speakers and are in the United States have a legal status, right? They're, they're citizens. When it comes down to the Hispanic market, it doesn't, it's not always the case. To make a point that you can and are entitled for medical care and for compensation, even if you do not have a, a, a legal status, then it becomes important. And so that's like a, a good illustration of what does it mean to understand the different roadblocks and pain points that they may feel and that they are particular to them. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a big one. That's a big one. And under, it comes back down to really just really understanding your ideal customer, your prospect, yep. and knowing them and knowing them inside out. Yeah, this I, it's great. This is huge. Tell us a little bit about working with Nanata Media. Who you, obviously you work with attorneys. Tell us a little bit about your process. Yeah, thank you. We really like to establish trust, right? That I think is the most important thing. Most of people that come and want to work with us up until this point have been referrals, have been people who have already heard or know somebody that is working with us, which always helps. But we still understand that this is a new relationship. And for that reason, we feel that we are all going to be better off if we start from a place where there is an abundance of knowledge and of insights. And so when we are starting a new potential collaboration, our first step is us consulting for the potential client in helping them understand, first of all, who is their Hispanic market? Because while they may already come with some notion of who is or what... Oh, sorry. Sorry, hit the wrong button. <laughs> no problem, no problem. While they may be coming already with some notion of who the Latino market is, oftentimes they're missing some elements from the picture that are important, right? And so we help them first understand that so that they have a full under a full view of what is the potential that the market has understanding the demand and also understand the the competitor the their competitors landscape and within that also identifying what are the weak points that their competitors have and the low hanging fruit that they could be leveraging and we feel that the moment that we are able to present all of this information to a potential client and tell them here it is. It's all here for you. Now you can decide how do you want to go about it. And if you need some help in implementing some of these solutions or some of these opportunities, we can certainly explore being your partner for that also. But I think that empowering our partners into having a better view, a better understanding, and being a better position to make decisions about their Hispanic marketing is, is the best thing that we can do for anyone that is interested in not just partnering with us, but investing in their Hispanic market in a more efficient and ROI focused way. Beautiful. Awesome. So that's awesome. where we so, started. Yeah. So we'll make sure to put a link to, to all this in the show notes. I'll put a link to both of your books. And Leah, where do you spend most of your time on social media? Where should we have people follow you? It's <laughs> definitely my cup of tea. That's at least where I think, or I, I tell myself that I'm a little bit more active. I'm more of a <laughs> passive listener of Twitter, but I no longer spend that much time in that venue. So I think LinkedIn is the best way to find the best place to find me. Awesome. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Leo, thank you so much for being on the Garlic Marketing Show. My pleasure, Ian. Thank you so much for having me again. And make sure to check out Leo. If you're thinking about at all 
entering the Hispanic market, give them a call. If you're having trouble entering the Hispanic market, give them a call. But also don't forget to follow him on LinkedIn and tell him you saw him here. Thank you all for taking Leo and I in your journey, this benign garlic and the garlic marketing show.